Namaste Sarasati Devi Oravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschachadeshatarine Vanchakaupa Terubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Welcome everyone to our study, Bhakti Vai Bhav, Srimad Bhagavatam, at the level of Bhakti Vai Bhav. And we're studying Canto 2 and continuing our study of Chapter 9. Right? Chapter 9. Uh, answers by citing the Lord's version. All right, so this uh, chapter came out of the inquiry of Narada Muni. He wanted to know because the order had been given to distribute the knowledge. So Narada had inquired from Lord Brahma, and Lord Brahma was describing how he had, at the beginning of creation, he had performed his penance and then the Lord had appeared to him and shake and shook hands with him. And at that time Lord Brahma took the opportunity to put some questions to the personality of Godhead. He particularly wanted to remain humble in his work of creation. He didn't want to become proud. And he wanted to have proper understanding about the Lord in all of his different aspects. So we heard from text, tw text number 26 and 27, the first couple of questions put by Lord Brahma. Right? He won't. He, won't. he wanted to know about the Lord's energies. He wanted to know how the Lord creates this world. Described in text number 30, 31, in the purport there, you have the four questions. What are the forms of the Lord in matter and transcendence? And the the different energies of the Lord. How does the Lord play with his different energies? And then how many, how may Brahma be instructed to discharge the duty entrusted to him? Of course, Brahma's duty was to, to do the creation, creating the different bodies of the living entities and situating the planets in their proper positions. This was all the work of Lord Brahma. The initial creation done by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and that's Sarga, and the Visharga is done by Lord Brahma, the secondary creation. So the Lord's answers to these questions uh, the Chatur Sloki, the four verses which summarize the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam. 
Uh, these four verses, they appear twice in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. You'll find them first of all in the Adi Leela, in the first chapter. And there, there's a number of, there's very nice purports also, given by Srila Prabhupada. And then the four verses are repeated again in Madhya Leela, at the end of the Madhya Leela, the final chapter, chapter 25, I think. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had been instructing Sanatana Goswami and he explained the Atmarama verse and he explained also the Chatur Sloki. So these four verses are very important and what's important is that we have to be able to present these four verses according to the Vaishnava philosophy. The Mayavadis, the impersonalists, the Dvaitavadis, they're also very much attached to this Chatur Sloki. They like the Chatur Sloki very much because it's, for them it's an opportunity to present their Mayavadi philosophy. And when you read through Prabhupada's purports, you see, wow, Prabhupada is really powerful. He's really preaching against this, this impersonal teachings. Because Prabhupada knew how deep the impersonal philosophy had gone throughout, through all the people of India. And not only India, the whole world become affected by the impersonal teachings, the impersonal thinking. So Prabhupada preaches very strongly about it. He really goes into it. And we'll look at Prabhupada's preaching there. But first of all, uh, we have the prelude to the Chatur Sloki in text number 32. The Lord is speaking. He's text number 32. All of me, namely my actual eternal form and my transcendental existence, colour, qualities and activities, let all be awakened within you by factual realization out of my causeless mercy. So Prabhupada makes a point he, again throughout the purport in this case that to actually understand the Lord the qualification is not material but there has to be that causeless mercy. Simply by the grace of the Supreme Lord we can understand him. Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, right, in Chatur Sloki, to those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So it's the mercy of Krishna by which we can actually understand the Lord. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada writes there, in, the, in that purport, at the beginning of the purport, here we can see that the Lord is sufficiently pleased with Brahma. Certainly he was pleased with Brahma, right? He appeared before Lord Brahma, he shook hands with Brahma, and he had also shown Brahma the Vaikuntha planets. He showed him the spiritual world. Brahma was residing in the material universe. But by the grace of the Lord, he was able to see the spiritual world. So, the Lord offers his causeless mercy to Brahma, so that Brahma may have the factual realization of the Lord, by his mercy only. Now, we don't want just only academic understanding. We want some actual realization. That realization comes by the grace of the Lord. So then Prabhupada discusses about the form of the Lord, that because the impersonalists generally considered that the Lord, he, there's no form. Everything is without nirakar, without form. But they don't understand that spiritual form doesn't mean no form, 
but it means a form which is not material. It's of a different type. Prabhupada writes in the purport, a spiritual body is not formless. It is a different type of body of which we cannot conceive with our present mundane senses. So this is a problem that we try to understand the spiritual world or spiritual, a spiritual body, we try to describe it with our limited mundane conditioning. We cannot properly express or describe it. We have no real experience of it. We have to hear, therefore, from the, from the Lord himself and from the Lord's devotees. Then only we can know more about the nature of the spiritual world. And Prabhupada goes into some detail describing the nature of the Lord, how he has transcendental, how his form is transcendental, but at the same time there's so much variety. And Prabhupada gives the different colours of the bodies of the Lord. He talks about reddish, uh, yellowish, uh, whitish, blackish. Of course, th these are the colours of the Yuga avatars. And then some of the forms of the Lord are two-handed, as in Goloka Vrindavan. And other forms of the Lord may be four-handed, as in Vaikuntha. So, we see the specific features of the form of the Lord, that he does have a body and he, he can take different forms. He's not limited to our, to what we think, to like, to, he doesn't have to be like a human being. Sometimes he takes the form of a, a fish, and sometimes a half lion, half man, sometimes he takes the form of the, the turtle, so, so many different forms, the boar, even the Lord can come in any different form he chooses, just to show us his inconceivable potency, that he's beyond the powers of our mind and senses. Of course, all of these things, this is all very difficult for the impersonalists who want to understand everything by empirical knowledge. So they have a problem hearing about all of these things and they will try to explain it and interpret and speculate about it. We should understand, however, that although they may go on with their speculations, they can never give us a proper conclusion to the understanding of these teachings. So at the end of the purport, Srila Prabhupada has written, that the impersonal interpretation of the mundane wrangler is completely refuted in this verse because it is clearly stated here that the Supreme Lord has his qualities, form, pastimes and everything that a person has. All these descriptions of the transcendental nature of the Personality of Godhead are factual realizations by the devotee of the Lord and by the causeless mercy of the Lord they are revealed to his pure devotees and to no one else. <laughs> so there's a qualification. You want to see the, the form of the Lord, we want to understand. We have to be qualified. We know from the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna said, I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my yoga maya. So we, we don't want to remain foolish and covered. We want to become intelligent. And the process is going to be described to us here in this Chatur Sloki, the four verses which are summarizing this Srimad Bhagavatam. So just as there were four verses summarizing Bhagavad Gita, the, these four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam, they're actually the original verses of the Bhagavatam. 
as it was spoken by the personality of Godhead to Lord Brahma. So the, the first two verses represent what is called Sambandha Gyan. Then the third verse represents Prayojana Gyan. And the fourth verse is Abhidaya Gyan. And by speaking these four verses, the four questions of Lord Brahma are all answered. Right? The first question, what is the form of the Lord in matter and transcendence? So, in reply to that question, the Personality of Godhead speaks verse number 33. Aham eva sam eva gre nanya yad sad asad param paschadaham yad etascha yova shishita sosmi aham. So Brahma is being spoken to, and the personality of Godhead is telling him that there's nothing but me. Before the creation, I was existing. There was nothing but the Lord Himself. Nor was there material nature. Even the material nature was present. That's the cause of the creation. And what you see now is also myself, the personality of Godhead. And after annihilation, the personality of Godhead will remain. So the aham, aham meva sam meva gri, this I, this is very convenient for the speculations of the mayavadi, the impersonalists. And Prabhupada gives it the impersonalist argument here, he describes it in his purport, just right in the first paragraph, just a few sentences into the first paragraph, Prabhupada explains how the impersonalists will interpret this. He said, the impersonalists put forth the theory of oneness in the sense that Brahma also being the same principle of I, because he is an emanation from the I, the absolute truth, is identical with the Lord, the principle of I, and that which is thus nothing more than the principle of I, as explained in this verse. In other words, everything is simply one. There's simply I. <laughs> so th this is very convenient for the presentation of the Mayavadi philosophy, you see. I am you, you are me. We are all the I, we're all one, we're all God. If we're all the one, we're all the one supreme. So let's be God. So Prabhupada then goes on to refute these arguments and he talks about, yeah, it's all right, okay, if we accept this theory that, you, that because Brahma came from you, so you're one, yeah. But still, Prabhupada explains, one person was the predominator and the other is predominated. You're not equal. Just like the father is the father's a son, doesn't mean that the Father and the Son are one. There's a difference. The Father produced the Son. And so they're of the same nature, but still they're individuals. There's a difference. So Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada in the purport goes on to explain, to completely defeat this Mayavadi proposition. And usually when you're speaking to Mayavadis, it's a very, good, a very good verse to quote. It's a verse which Prabhupada has given here in the purport from the Katopanishad, right? Very famous, because that is actually Shruti. In quoting the Katopanishad, he's quoting Shruti, because you're speaking to people who may be Vedantists. They may not accept the Bhagavad Gita. And if you quote Bhagavad Gita, they're not impressed. They say, no, no, we don't accept Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada is very cautious to present evidence from the Shruti, the Katopanishad, 
and he gives this very well-known verse, which is very much feared by the Mayavadis, <laughs> because they cannot refute it. Because the verse says, amongst all eternal, there's one supreme eternal being. And amongst all conscious beings, there's one supremely conscious being. And that one supreme Lord is providing the needs of everyone. So it's a very, very powerful evidence to quote this verse. The Ridayananda Maharaj used it when, at one point when he was challenging. He had to speak in a, an assembly of Mayavadi professors. And when he quoted this verse, then they, they all crumbled. They couldn't reply to it. They had no answer. And Prabhupada was very pleased when he heard, he congratulated him in presenting the Vaishnava philosophy. So you can take a note of that verse and the importance of quoting Shruti in preaching to these kind of people is very, very important. So Prabhupada talks about there's the creator and the created. The creator meaning the Supreme Lord. And Brahma is created. Brahma has to take birth. Brahma is predominated. He's not the predominator. He's under the control of the Supreme Lord. So we have to, under, the, the, the Mayavadis, the Vedantas, the Advaitavadis, they have to understand, they have to recognize this, of course. Very difficult to convince them about these things. But we have to present the Vaishnava philosophy. They don't, they don't accept it, but it doesn't mean we're not going to present the teachings as it should be. Okay. Uh, continuing to look at this purport here, text number 30, 34, 33. Uh, Prabhupada begins, in another feature of this verse, no one can deny the personalities of both the Lord and Brahma. Therefore, in the ultimate issue, both the predominator and the predominated are persons. So Prabhupada is, he, he quoted Shastra, now he's giving logic. By logic, he's establishing that there's a difference. Someone is supreme and someone is under the control of the supreme. Different, using different methods to defeat the Mayavadi philosophy. This is one of the things which Prabhupada very much stressed upon us as devotees. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, because Madhvacharya completely refuted Mayavadi philosophy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, recognized the teachings of Madhva. And he, he took that element from the Madhva Sampradaya and brought it into his own Gaudiya Vaishnava movement. Madhvacharya also very heavily attacked the Mayavadi philosophy. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appreciated that and brought it into his own sampradaya. So in the, in the verse, this first verse of the Chatur Sloki, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is explaining that before the creation, during the maintenance of the universe, and after the annihilation of the universe, he will continue to exist at all phases of the creation, before it's created, while it's maintained, and after it's annihilated. There will be no change in the existence of the Personality of Godhead. He's not subjected to any change. And then Srila Prabhupada in his purport, he goes on, goes on to talk about the Kingdom of the Lord. And then where is he going to reside? You know, if he, if he's there, when the world is annihilated, before the creation, where does he live? He must have his kingdom. There must be some place. So then Prabhupada explains about the Vaikuntha planets. 
and he tells us that the kingdom of God is not void as the impersonalists think or the, they, they have no understanding about the variety which is there in the kingdom of God. For the impersonalists there's simply the light, just simply the energy, the oneness and they want to enter into that. But it's not like that. That Brahma Jyoti, that is only the effulgence coming from the body of the Supreme Lord. Within the spiritual realm, there are Vaikuntha planets and there are many planets and we were hearing about them. They were described to us in the previous chapter and here also the Lord is explaining, or Prabhupada in his purport, he's pointing out that there is a spiritual world and there are planets there and there are residencies and the Lord resides there in many different forms. And they're not subject to creation, maintenance or annihilation. They're eternally maintained. Prabhupada writes, the existence of the personality of Godhead implies the existence of the Vaikuntha Lokas. As the existence of a king implies the existence of a kingdom. A king obviously must have a kingdom. So the same way the Supreme Lord, he has also his abode, the kingdom of God. And Vaikuntha planets are there. And we should understand another difference in the impersonal philosophy. For the impersonalists, there's no kingdom of God, there's no planets, there's only the light enter into that one effulgence. Another difference is in relation to the activities. What actually takes place in the spiritual world? Are there any activities there? His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami, at one point he arranged to meet with a cardinal from the Roman Catholic Church. This was over in the Philippines, in Manila. So he made an appointment to meet because this one cardinal had become very, very high up in the Catholic Church. He was almost on the level of the Pope. So Tamal Krishna Goswami arranged a meeting with him he wanted to discuss their theology with them. So he asked this cardinal about what is it like in the kingdom of God? Because, of course, in the Catholic Church, they also believe that God is a person and king, they talk about the kingdom of God. So he asked him, what is it like in your theology? Can you tell me how, what is the kingdom of God? How is it there? What are the activities? But the cardinal said, well, I can't tell you that. He said, we don't have that in our theology. We don't have any answers to this. We don't have information about this. So we can see how complete the Vedic knowledge is, that within our Vedic theology, there's full descriptions about the kingdom of God and the activities and everything. Mm. Also, it, um, in the purple Prabhupada points out, he says the, the activities of Brahma and other demigods during the maintenance of the creation should be understood to be the activities of the Lord. So just maintaining the material world, we can, this is considered, you know, generally of course Brahma is the creator, but he also helps with the work of maintenance, just like Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is not just responsible for annihilation, Lord Shiva takes part in the creation, 
He takes part in the maintenance and his major duty comes at the time of the destruction of the universe. So similarly, Lord Brahma, he's a creator, but he also helps the Lord in the maintenance of the universe. Sometimes we see Mother Bhumi going to pray to the Lord when there's some problem in the universe, she comes to Lord Brahma for help. And if Lord Brahma cannot solve it, then he will go to Lord Vishnu. And so, like that, a hierarchy of management. One manager can't solve it, you go to the higher up manager. So if Lord Brahma can't deal with it, then they go to Lord Vishnu. But they're all, they're all active. They're all engaged in different activities, overseeing the affairs of the creation. And Prabhupada also points out that about describing the Lord as being formless, he, he gives an interesting sight on this. He said that sometimes he may be called formless, but actually he's always in his eternal form in his Vaikuntha planets. So why does he, why is he described, why is he being described as formless? Just because certain people are not able to understand the form of the Lord. Therefore he may be called formless. Prabhupada gives an example about the sun. He said, just like the sun, it's not visible at night. There's no way you can see the sun at night. It's hidden from our sight. In the same way, a person cannot see the form of the Lord. He's not, he's, he's not qualified, he doesn't have the qualification to be able to see the Lord. Therefore, the Lord is described as formless. Even if they did see the Lord, they cannot understand that He is the Lord. Just like when Lord Krishna was on the planet, different people met Lord Krishna, they couldn't understand that He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You have Kamsa's laundry man, and you have people like the servants of Kamsa, there was the one man controlling the elephant, Kuvala Yapida, and he was trying to use the elephant to at attack Lord Krishna. So they could not understand Krishna's identity, even though they could see him, but they could not understand him factually. In the same way, people go to the Holy Dham, people come to Vrindavan, they see the Holy Dham, but actually they don't see the Dham. The Dham is covered to them. They simply see, oh, dirty, oh, cows, oh, this and that. They simply see with their material eyes. They're not able to actually see the real transcendental abode of the Lord. The Lord is covered the same way the Lord's abode is covered to the non-devotees. So the Lord has different features. We see, we heard about the Lord's universal form. So the universal form of the Lord contains everything material. So that universal form, that is seen by the pantheists. And then you have an impersonal form of the Lord. The impersonal form of the Lord has nothing material. It's not material. It's just what it, it's without form. It's just simply some. It's energy. So the monists they see the impersonal feature of the Lord. And the pantheists they. Their contemplation is on the universal form of the Lord.
but the devotees, they want to see the Lord in his original transcendental form. They will see the Lord either as Lord Vishnu or as Lord Krishna. But we should understand that the Lord is both impersonal and personal. He's not limited. He has both the impersonal feature and the personal feature. It's described. Uh, Jiva Goswami has written Sandarbhas, and the first Sandarbha is called Tadva Sandarbha. And then Tadva Sandarbha, Tadva, how do we understand Tadva? It's described in the second chapter of the first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Vedanti tat tadvam vijam tad, tadvam ya jnana madvayam brahmati paramatmati bhagavan iti shabyate. Learned transcendentalists who know the absolute truth call this non dual substance as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So there are three aspects to ta There's the Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So the third Sandarbha is called Paramatma. And then the fourth Sandarbha is Bhagavan, Bhagavan Bhagavat Sandarbha. And then the second Sandarbha, that's actually about the Brahman, so the, he won't call it the Brahman Sandarbha, he calls it the Bhagavat Sandarbha. So like this Jiva Goswami, he's described uh, the different aspects of the Absolute Truth and he's taken on many different points from the Srimad Bhagavatam to answer different doubts and different inquiries we may have in studying Srimad Bhagavatam. So we should understand the Lord's feature, how he is both personal and impersonal. Therefore, the, when the Lord says, Aham, Prabhupada said, it can never indicate anything other than the Supreme Lord. We should, therefore, follow the path of the Brahma Sampradaya, or the path from Brahmaji to Narad to Vyas, like that. And the conclusion of this first verse of the Chatur Sloki is that we should be attached to the root of everything and don't become bewildered by all the branches of the, of the tree, but get to the root. This is the instruction which is given by Lord Brahma in this first verse of Chatur Sloki. So this is Sambandha Gyan, very clearly you can understand this is Sambandha Gyan. Are there any questions so far? Anybody want to bring up some points? Maharaj, I have got questions. Yes? Maharaj, in the puppet, like uh, in the. This written. Uh, the Akshar Purush or Mahavishnu draw his glance over Prakriti. So only the Akshar Purush is Mahavishnu only, not Garbhodaksha Vishnu and they are not Akshar, Akshar Purush. Yes, the Akshar Purush is Mahavishnu, right. The Garbhodaksha Vishnu and the Garbhodaksha Vishnu, he is not Akshar Purush. Well, the original Vishnu is Mahavishnu. Right? Karbhadakshai Vishnu is just simply the expansion coming from Mahavishnu within the universe. When he creates the, the when the universes come from his body, then Karbhadakshai Vishnu enters into the universe. But the initial creation is all done by Mahavishnu. Also, Maharaj, in the next paragraph. In some of the Vedas, it is also said that in the beginning only the impersonal Brahman ex existed. Yes, some of the Vedas say like that. Why, but 
Vedas are from the personality, supreme personality of Godhead. Then why in the Vedas there is written because the statement is written bewildering. Uh, because uh, only the impersonal Brahman is written. But we have to understand that that Brahm, that the Brahman has an origin. Where does it come from? Right. That the Brahman, you see, the Brahman is that's the beginning of the material creation because everything in the material world is coming from the Brahman. So Brahman has different, in the, in different understandings. Of course, in the spiritual world, Brahman, the Brahma Jyoti is there. That Brahma Jyoti is coming from the body of the Lord, and then that Brahman is used to initiate the material creation, all the different elements of the material world, their transformations from the Brahman. It's all the energy of the Lord. So the Brahman can have different, it can be understood in different ways. We can understand the Brahman as being simply the energy of the Lord, the external potency of the Lord, but in the spiritual sky, it's the effulgence coming from the body of the Lord. So it's a little different, but it's the same Brahman. It's just entering into the material creation to facilitate the creation of all the elements. So it's all done through the energy of the Lord. Everything is the energy of the Lord. That's proper. So what is that energy? That energy of the Lord, that is Brahman. But the Brahman transforms into so many different elements. Thank you, Maharaj. Also, Maharaj, in the same paragraph, there is written, one has to spiritualize the senses before one can expect to see or perceive the Lord. But he is always engaged in his, in his personal capacity. What do we mean by this? What, I can't understand. He is always engaged in his personal capacity. Why is this capacity, personal capacity mentioned with the Lord and what does it mean? Well, the Lord, as a person, he is enjoying, he, he has his different responsibilities, right? He's overseeing the whole creation. We just heard, we just narrated about how he shook hands with Lord Brahma. That's a very personal exchange. This is personal rasas basically mentioning to our personal rasas with devotees. Yes. Yeah, definitely the Lord's going to exchange with the devotees. It's only with the devotees who's he's going to enjoy the personal exchange. The demons, well, some some special demons he may kill, but <laughs> that's not very common. Just sometimes when he incarnates into the world he may kill a demon or two. But generally his interest is with the devotees and he wants to encourage Lord Brahma in his work of creation. And of course he is also encouraging Lord Na Narada Muni. Narada Muni is also one of his great devotees, so the Lord appreciates him. And sometimes there will be personal exchange. Maharaj, uh, Krishna shook hands with Brahmaji and we are from Brahm Sampradaya. Then if we also preach, then he will shook hands with, all, with, uh, with us also. Or uh, we can understand this way, ki, uh, other, like the people, the devotees in other rasas, then uh, if they go to the spiritual Golokadham, then Lord will deal with, with them in, in their rasas. Like the one who will, uh, if a devotee will go with the Vatsalaras, Krishna will not shook hand with him and he will deal with him in a different way. Yes, of course, it won't all be the same. We have to understand, just like, you know, we hear Putana went back to Godhead to become Krishna's mother, but she's not like Mother Yashoda. You know, she she doesn't have the, she doesn't get that same into, nobody can be like Mother Yashoda, but she's a nurse, but she's at a distance. She's not going to be so intimate with Lord Krishna. So similarly, you may be a friend with Lord Krishna, but there are different levels of friendship. We see Arjuna's friendship with Krishna, and 
Sometimes Arjuna would feel very sorry, he'd been over intimate with Lord Krishna. And you have the cowherd boys who are so intimate with Krishna, they can climb on Krishna's back and wrestle with Krishna and things. But then you have Uddhava. Uddhava is also a friend of Krishna, but he's not like the cowherd boys, and he won't sit on the same level as Lord Krishna. And he will sit down. When Krishna takes a seat, Krishna and Uddhava will be sure to sit below the level of Lord Krishna. So the, we have to understand there's a lot of variety there in these different relationships. It's not everybody's going to be shaking hands, you know, lining up to shake hands with Krishna. But remember, Brahma did a lot of penance, you know, and Krishna was very pleased with him. And because he did the penance, because he wants to do the service for Krishna, he wants to do this creation. Okay. Thank you, Anand. Okay, we'll go ahead to the second verse of the Chatur Sloti, number 33. Right. O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. So, this is also Sambandha Gyan, describing the relationship between the Lord and the material creation and the living entities. Whatever we think to be without relationship to the Lord, this is the illusory energy. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, he said, nothing can exist without the Lord. It should be known the illusory energy is also an energy of the Lord. This is also, a, and then Prabhupada talks about the different, there, the, there's Mahamaya and then there's also Yoga Maya. So for the devotees, there's Yoga Maya. The devotees enjoy their relationship with the Lord through Yoga Maya. But for the others who are in the darkness of material existence, they're under the control of what's called Daivi Maya or Maha Maya. So some distinction is there. Uh, it, it's, it's the wrong conception. We should understand that there's no, ultimately everything is the Lord's energy. So then Prabhupada goes on to give the example, the uh, very useful example, analogy, about the rope in the snake. Right? Someone may think, oh, it's a snake, it's a snake. But it's not a snake, it's a rope. So that is an example of illusion. It's not that the snake is, a, is, is wrong, but there is such a thing as snakes and there are ropes. But we, we're not able to distinguish what was a snake and what was a rope. So. One is to, to think of something as some, what it's not, that is a, the illusion, right? The, the, both the rope and the snake are real, but we have not correctly identified them. So Prabhupada describes like that, this example, to some, in some length he goes through the, the, this example. Uh, the ident and then he talks about how we misunderstand our own self, that we think of ourselves as the body. Now, the, of course, the body exists, but it, it, it's not that the body is the actual self. The actual self is the soul within the body. And if we're thinking, I am the body, then that is the illusion, that is the maya. We exist, but we don't just exist as a body. We live in, in the body. And that illusion can go on further in trying to understand the Supreme Lord, that we, we think of the soul as being the Supreme Lord. Oh, I'm a soul, 
and I, my soul is God, I'm God. So that is an, another illusion. There is God and there is a living entity, but we misidentified the living entity. We thought the living entity is being one with the Supreme. So he, he is one, but at the same time different. So like this, there's different understandings, mis levels of illusion. So Prabhupada's purpose says, Brahma himself was born from the energy of the Lord, and all other living entities are born from the energy of the Lord through the agency of Brahma. Not, none, of, not, none of them has any existence without being dovetailed with the Supreme Lord. So everything is in relationship with the Supreme Lord. Nothing is independent. It is a simply illusion to think we're independent. The false claim of supreme independence by the conditioned souls is illusion. And this conclusion is admitted in this verse. So we should understand everything is dependent on the Lord. And this point has been made in other places within the section of the Bhagavatam, how we're all totally dependent on the control of the Supreme Lord. We're thinking we're very advanced, we're progressing in technology, but Prabhupada writes here, it's all such advancement of science and a knowledge in the present context of material civilization is but an action of the covering influence of the illusory energy. Right? The influence of Maya. There are two potencies. There's the throwing and the covering. So the throwing potency, putting the living entity into the material world, and then the covering where we become more and more forgetful of our actual position and actual condition of life. So this, the different effects of Maya are described like that. So we want to get out of that ignorance. How to get out of that ignorance? Well, we have to understand that ignorance is just simply darkness. And they talk about reflections, and uh, th there's the reflection, and there's also the uh, yes, the, the illusion and the reflection, which appears to be in darkness. So a reflection in darkness is not going to take away the light. There may be some reflection in the darkness, but that kind of light will never overcome the, 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 the object of lo the, the light. You have to come to the real light. The source of light have to come into the light. If you're in the darkness, just having a reflection there is not going to remove the light. It's not going to overcome the darkness, rather. This darkness is the ignorance of the living entity, forgetfulness of his actual spiritual existence. And to come out of that ignorance, devotees need to associate with somebody who is in the light. We get the, the effulgent personalities who carry the message of Godhead with them, and they can remove the darkness of ignorance. Just like we prayed that we offer our, our obeisances to the spiritual master who opens our eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. So the darkness of ignorance is removed by the torchlight of knowledge. We have to get the association of those who are in the light, who, have the, who, have, who know the truth and they can give it to us and open our eyes so we can actually see the truth. So just the reflection, the, the, that reflected light is not going to help. 
if we simply hear from people who are still materially affected, then it's not going to help us to overcome the material illusion. Prabhupada writes, the ignorant person, therefore, may, ev may even be a scientist or physiologist in the drama of Prakriti, while the same person knows Prakriti as the illusory energy, the same person knows Prakriti as the illusory energy of the Lord. So the scientists, they're simply thinking the prakriti, the material nature, but they don't have any higher knowledge of whose prakriti is it, whose energy is it, who's controlling it, where did it come from, what is the origin of the prakriti. But the devotee, one who's actually in knowledge, he understands that this prakriti is simply the illusory energy of the Lord. It's the external potency of the Lord. And it has, it's under the control of the Supreme Lord. So one who actually sees things as they are, he can understand the nature of everything. Prabhupada gives some nice examples. He talks about the energy of the fire. Energy of the fire being heat is a reflection. It's not directly fire. The heat of the fire is not directly fire. It's just simply a reflection from the fire. In the same way, the living entity the, the, or the living energy of the Lord the living energy represented by the living entity is a reflection of the Lord and never the Lord himself, right? We have some potency of the Lord. We may have the energy of the Lord. We are sparks of the Brahman, but we're not para-Brahman. We're not the supreme Brahman. That would be ignorance, gross ignorance to think like that. So we are, we're, the living entities, all, we're considered reflections of the Lord. Not the Lord himself, but reflections of his potency. And all the activities of the living entity in the, in the darkness are like reflections of the original light. Whatever we do in this material world, if it's all based around the body and the senses, these are just activities in darkness, they're reflections of the original light. So, how to solve, how to get out of this condition? We have to get, we have to receive the light from the original light, the original source of light itself, the reflection of sunlight is not going to drive out the darkness. So where to get the light? We have to, we have to study Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. From these literatures, Prabhupada said, this is like the light of the Lord. We have to take the light of the Lord from, as in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, not just some reflection from some other mundane source of knowledge. We have to hear the absolute truth. So the, the actual light comes from the Lord and then we can see directly the Lord. Again, you want to, we want to realize the Lord, we need also the causeless mercy of the Lord. Prabhupada said, God can be seen by the light of God, 
not by man-made speculations. People often want to see God. They want to see God. So, <laughs> see God by the light of God. We see him through the light of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. And one day you may be fortunate to see him as the Lord Brahma saw him. And he may come and shake hands with you if you have pleased him. But we have to please, we have to know how to please him. We have to work on his behalf. So we're, we're hearing, first of all, the knowledge of Sambandha, the, about the energy of the Lord. And then text 35 goes on to describe, text 35, the answer to the third question put by Brahma about how does, how does the Lord play with his energies? So the Lord replies, he said, please know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos and at the same time do not enter in the cosmos. Similarly, I myself also exist within everything created and at the same time I am outside of everything. <laughs> we can see his playful nature that he's within everything, at the same time he's outside of everything. So anyway, this text number 35, this is described to be prayojana pyan, meaning the goal, the goal of our devotional activities. The first two verses, text 33 and 34, were sambandha, knowledge of the relationship between the Lord and his energies. And now, Lord Vishnu is describing the goal. And what is the goal? It's the most confidential thing. The actual goal is to develop love for God. Krishna praying. This was already hinted at earlier. Uh, earlier, there were some indications from the Lord. He was talking about the, the different hints which, he, he, which would be revealed. Just like he's, he's, he's given us Gyan and Vigyan. Gyan meaning knowledge and Vigyan meaning realized knowledge, actual application of that transcendental knowledge. And now we're hearing about the most confidential aspect of this process. The most confident. Why is it confidential? One reason is because it's very difficult for ordinary people to understand. They don't have the qualification to be able to understand the confidential loving exchange which takes place between the Supreme Lord and his devotees. And they will think of everything according to their own limited conceptions. However, we should understand there is such a thing as love of God and that love is experienced, it's, this is the result of properly applying the process of devotional service. As we go through the, the stages of devotional service, one day we should also come to that stage of love of God. You can read in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, it's described how Lord Chaitanya was describing how when he chants the Maha Mantra, he feels so much ecstasy and happiness and tears from his eyes and so many ecstatic symptoms. And he told the spiritual master, what kind of mantra is this you've given me? That it makes me almost like a mad person. So the spiritual master was very pleased. He said, oh, this is very nice. You have under, you've come to the proper goal of chanting the holy name. You have developed love for God. So here also in the Chatur Sloki, 
Lord Vishnu is describing to us about this prayojana, about how we can also develop our love for the Lord. Of course, to develop the love for God, you have to, we have to know the Sambandha. We have to go through the Abhidaya and then we come to the Prayojana. It's not that we can immediately get Krishna praying. We have to develop the qualification. So in the purport here, I just read a little bit Prabhupada writes about uh, how the impersonalists understand these things. He says that the impersonalist can imagine or even perceive that the Supreme Brahman is thus all-pervading. And therefore, they conclude that there is no possibility of his personal form. Right? They're thinking if God is everywhere, he cannot be a person. He cannot be in one place. So they limit the Supreme Lord. They think, oh no, he's everywhere, so he's, he cannot be in one place, he cannot have a personal form because he's simply all-pervading. They don't appreciate the inconceivable potency of the Lord. So Prabhupada said, herein lies the mystery of his transcendental knowledge. This mystery is transcendental love of Godhead. And one who is surcharged with such transcendental love of Godhead can without difficulty see the personality of Godhead in every atom and every movable or immovable object. So, of course, this is described in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he said, For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost to him, nor is he ever lost to me. So that was chapter six, Bhagavad Gita. But here, uh, Prabhupada is describing to us how the pure devotee can see the Lord everywhere also. Without difficulty, he can see Krishna in every atom, every movable or immovable object. One reporter, newspaper reporter, was interviewing Srila Prabhupada and he, he asked Prabhupada, have you seen God? And Prabhupada replied, I'm seeing God at every moment. I'm seeing God everywhere. And one of the devotees who was there with Prabhupada, he tried to uh, reduce what Prabhupada was saying. He tried to minimize it. He said, yeah, but what Prabhupada means is he's saying, you know, you can see the energy of God, you know, not that he actually sees God, but he simply sees the energy of God. And Prabhupada said, no. He said, I actually see God. I actually see him as a person. So, we should understand the pure devotees. They can actually see the Lord as a person. And we you can also see the Lord. Prabhupada goes on, you can see him in his own abode. Prabhupada said, this vision is the real mystery of spiritual knowledge, as stated by the Lord in the beginning. This mystery is the most confidential part of the knowledge of the Supreme. And it is impossible for mental speculators to discover by dint of intellectual gymnastics. The mystery can be revealed through this process recommended by Brahmaji, by his Brahma Samhita. And then Prabhupada quotes, as he would often quote, right, when he would say, there's only one qualification to see God, and then the verse would come from the Brahma Samhita. Pray manjana charita bhakti vilo chanina. Like that. And it's verse number, verse number 38 in the Brahma Samhita. So Prabhupada 
telling us, this is how you see God. When the eyes are anointed with love of God, then you can actually see God, Krishna, Shamsunda, with inconceivable, inconceivable, innumerable attributes. But we don't simply see with the eyes, we see with the ointment, we see with the eye of love of God. So we have to purify the senses. And how do we purify the senses? That is the abhidaya, that is the process. Prabhupada continues in the purport, he says, Still the mystery is unfolded before the eyes of the pure devotees, because their eyes are anointed with love of Godhead. So that is what we want. We want to develop that pure, pure vision, pure love. And Prabhupada then continues to explain more about the relationship between Krishna and his pure devotees. And he talks about uh, they, they can actually see the pastimes which are taking place in Vaikuntha, far beyond the material manifestation. The, the activities which are going on in the Vaikunthas are being televised in the heart of the devotees. The pure devotees, they can actually see the pastimes of the Lord in Vaikuntha. They see within their heart. They're taking part even in these activities. Although they may be in this material world, but their consciousness is in the spiritual world. And they're actually seeing, just like television, satellite television broadcasting from the other side, so, satellite television broadcasting from Goloka Vrindavan into the heart of the pure devotee. Prabhupada continues, Factually, the spiritually developed person is able to have the television of the kingdom of God always reflected within his heart. That is the mystery of knowledge of the Personality of Godhead. So this is very special, very confidential. We can understand why this section, this is Prayojana Gyan. The Lord is actually communicating into the heart of His pure devotees. Krishna is in the heart of His devotees and the devotees are in Krishna's heart. Prabhupada describes this transcendental devotional service of the Lord is so wonderful that the occupation keeps the deserving devotees always wrapped in psychological activities without deviation from the absolute touch. Psychological activities without deviation from the absolute touch. And so they're always absorbed in their mind, psychologically. Activities are going on there. This is a uh, Prabhupada, this love of God developed in the heart of the devotees is a great mystery. Certainly it's mysterious to us because we are conditioned souls. How much can we understand of these things? But it's very important for us to hear about it. And this is the goal that at some point we should get these messages also in our heart. We want to actually hear, we want to actually be seeing in our heart the pastimes of the spiritual world. So this is bhakti yoga. It's very mysterious and at the same time it's very wonderful. And Prabhupada says it's very difficult for the layman to understand without knowledge of the mystery. Very difficult. 
Bhagavad Gita says, Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam. Right? The king of knowledge, the most secret of all secrets. It's Raja Guyam, the most confidential. Then Prabhupada gives the example. He said, just like a touchstone is rarely found, so a pure devotee of the Lord is rarely to be seen. Even amongst millions of liberated souls, out of all kinds of perfection attained by the process of knowledge, yoga perfection in devotional service is the highest of all of the most mysterious, also even more mysterious than the eight kinds of mystic perfections attained by the process of yoga performances. And so mystic yoga, astanga yoga, astasiddhis, these kind of things, these are insignificant compared to the level of the pure devotees. The bhakti yogi is far above these yogis, the mystic yogis, and the, those who, even those people who have astasiddhis, this is not very relevant, not very significant in the eyes of a devotee. You know, the devotee, the bhakta, the one who has real devotional love for Krishna, he's on the highest platform. Mm. So at the end of the purport, Prabhupada says, if one is fortunate enough to have received the knowledge in the transcendental disciplic succession, surely he will have the chance to understand the mystery of the Lord and that of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the sound incarnation of the Lord. So this is the third verse of the Chatur Shloki, describing Prayojana Kyan. I encourage you also, read the purports in the Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila. They're very nice and very concise and very good to understand. They help us to give a greater understanding of this Chatur Shloki. So Adi Lila chapter 1, I think it's from about text 56. And you get the four verses and Prabhupada's very nice purports. All right, then we come to text number 36, which is the fourth verse of the Chatur Sloki. And this is describing the Abhidaya, or the process of devotional service. A person who is searching after the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead, must certainly search for it up to this, in all circumstances, in all space and time, and both directly and indirectly. So this is a, a very long purport here, which Srila Prabhupada has given. And Prabhupada goes into great detail to describe the universal nature of devotional service, how it can be performed anywhere, by anyone. And he talks about even worms and insects, they can also be engaged in devotional service. And even uncivilized people and people who have no good behavior, they can all take up devotional service. It doesn't matter where they're coming from or who they are, but if they're willing if they have that faith and that devotion to surrender, they can take up the path of devotional service and be successful. So we want to search after the Supreme, as it is described here, in all circumstances, in all space and time, both directly and indirectly. Directly means doing the things which are favorable for devotional service 
and indirectly means avoiding those things which are not favourable for devotional service. Certainly, in distributing the message of Krishna consciousness, one must have this kind of mood to be willing to accept anyone and everyone into the path of devotional service. And Srila Prabhupada exemplified that by going to the West in the 1960s. In the 1960s, when the West was in quite a bit of turmoil and there was a lot of agitation, anti-war, anti-Vietnam and this and that, but Srila Prabhupada went there to the West and he distributed Krishna consci consciousness to everyone. He didn't consider who was qualified or who was unqualified. And this is a scriptural basis for that activity. Now, not many devotees can do like that. I was, uh, I was in Vrindavan. After Prabhupada had left the body, we had Prabhupada's Smriti Sabha. And they invited Prabhupada's godbrothers to come and speak. So one of Prabhupada's godbrothers came. And he spoke, he said, he's, he's, he had actually already been sent to England by Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. He'd gone to England and he'd preached in England and then he'd come back to India. So his disciples had said, he was telling all of us, you know, he was addressing the audience and he was saying, my disciples said, you know, that I should also have gone to the West like Bhaktivedanta Swami. But he said, I would not like to preach to the people like what he preached to. The people he went to, the places he went to, and the people he met. He said, I wouldn't like to go there and give Krishna consciousness to them. You know, he, he didn't like the idea of giving Krishna consciousness without discrimination. He himself was a, some, somewhat of a scholarly devotee. And he liked to preach to the academic and the aristocratic people. But Prabhupada not only preached to the, the educated and the aristocratic, Prabhupada preached to everyone without discrimination. But he said, I wouldn't like to have preached to them. So he made the distinction. Prabhupada didn't make that distinction. He was applying this, this teaching which is given here in this verse, without, you know, going everywhere. So it's very amazing, the more we consider the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and his missionary work in pioneering Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada writes, in this purport about the importance of having a spiritual master, that it's not enough to just simply follow scriptures. Sometimes people think, you know, I'm reading the scriptures, why do I need a guru? I'm already reading a scripture, I've got the books, I read the book, why I need a guru? But it's very important. You, do have, you still have to have the personal guidance of a spiritual master. We should understand the necessity for that. And Srila Prabhupada indicates here, he said, although everyone is free to consult the revealed scriptures in this connection, one still requires the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. And that is the direction in this verse. The bona fide spiritual master is the confidential representative of the Lord. And one must receive directions from the spiritual master in the same spirit that Brahma received it from Lord Krishna. The bona fide spiritual master is that bona fide chain of disciplic sixth. The bona fide spiritual master in that bona fide chain of disciplic succession never claims to be the Lord himself, although such a spiritual master is greater than the Lord in the sense that he can deliver the Lord 
by his personally realized experience. This is the advantage of having the spiritual master, that he has personally realized the Lord and he can pass, give the Lord to himself. Krishna himself rarely gives pure devotional service. That is mentioned in Nectar of Devotion, that Krishna rarely gives pure devotion. But the pure devotees are more merciful than Krishna. So it's described here, the, the spiritual master is greater than the Lord in the sense that he can deliver the Lord. He can give us the Lord himself. The Lord doesn't give himself. But the pure devotee gives the Lord. So this is the importance of having a spirit, spiritual master. And then Prabhupada takes the advantage to talk also about the, the distortions which are there in the scriptures. Because he's saying just have the scriptures, it's not enough. You need to have also the spiritual teacher. The, and Prabhupada talks about so many distortions of the Bhagavad Gita and they don't give the real message of Bhagavad Gita. They simply give their own understanding of the Bhagavad Gita. They're presenting their own conclusions. They're not keeping in, in the tradition. They don't deliver the Bhagavad Gita as it is. So this Prabhupada says, in the Gita, practically, the same instruction is imparted as in the four prime verses of the Bhagavatam, but due to wrong and fashionable interpretations by unauthorized persons, one cannot reach the ultimate conclusion. This is a problem. People will take the Bhagavad Gita and they simply give their own conclusions. They give their own message. They don't give what Krishna is saying. They put their own ideas into it. So we have to be very conscious, very careful about this. So Prabhupada has elaborated in great detail about the power of devotional service and how we have to preach Krishna consciousness in many different situations and to everyone and everywhere without consideration. And the purpose is to bring them to Krishna consciousness, to get them out of the material life, bring them out of illusion, to give them a better life. Otherwise, they simply remain in the material world. They take birth again and again. In the purport, Prabhupada comments about how Jiva Goswami himself has commented on these words, Sarvatra Sarvada. Sarvatra Sarvada. Everywhere and every, anywhere and everywhere. And Prabhupada explains this is the principle of bhakti yoga or devotional service. Our act in all circumstances. Bhakti yoga is recommended in all the revealed scriptures. It is performed by all authorities. It is important in all places. It is useful in all causes and effects, etc. As far as all the revealed scriptures are concerned, he quotes from the Skanda Purana on the topics of Brahma and Narada. And he quotes from the Skanda Purana that the world is full of darkness and danger. The only way to get out of the entanglement is by devotional service. That is the conclusion. So Jiva Goswami supporting this. And continuing, they talk about the different living entities. There's a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam which we've already studied in the seventh chapter 
Second Canto, seventh chapter, where it says, the lowest of human beings can be elevated to the highest stage of devotional service if they are trained by the bona fide spiritual master who is well versed in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. If the lowest can be elevated, then what to speak of the highest who are well versed in the Vedic knowledge? The conclusion is that devotional service to the Lord is open for all, regardless of who they are. Of course, but for, there has to be the training. It's not enough. You just take initiation. You have to get trained. There has to be training. You have to hear regularly. And there has to be service. And in this way, we can gradually progress. So it's not just, oh, I got the mantra. We have to also get the training. So the association with the spiritual master is very important, very powerful. And Prabhupada quotes a Shastric verse from Garuda Purana, which says, even the worms, birds and beasts are assured of elevation to the highest perfection of life if they are completely surrendered to the transcendental loving service of the Lord. So what to speak of the philosophers amongst the human beings? So if, if you're a philosopher, it's very good. You have a better opportunity to understand these words of the scriptures. And then Prabhupada concludes, therefore, there's no need to seek properly qualified candidates for discharging devotional service to the Lord. <laughs> it could be anyone, because even, even the lowborn, they can all become very elevated persons by the power of devotional service. It's Prabhupada said, let them be learned or fools. They may be well-behaved or ill-trained, doesn't matter, anybody. They may be greatly attached or they may be in the renounced order of life. Let them be liberated souls or desirous of salvation. Let them be inexpert in the discharge of devotional service or let them be expert. All of them can be elevated to the highest stage of devotional service. And Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9. Mami Partavaipa, Yepishu Papa Yonaya, Papa Yonaya, that even their Papa Yonis, they can all become Tepiyanti Paramgatim, they can achieve the supreme destination, the Paramgatim. So any person whatsoever whosoever he or she may be, even the fallen woman, the less intelligent laborer, the dull mercantile man, or even a man lower than all these, can attain the highest perfection of life by going back home, back to Godhead, provided he takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord in all earnestness. So we have to be very serious. We have to understand this is a serious business. Krishna is giving us a chance. He's showing us a path, a very powerful, very perfect path. We have to take to the process with all seriousness. It's not a joke. But at the same time, there's joy there. There's a lot of joy within the activity. It's not dry. It's not mundane. It's blissful. We want the bliss. The bliss is there. We just have to purify ourselves and we can experience the bliss. So, whatever we do, we want to do it for the pleasure of the Lord. We shouldn't 
avoid service to the Supreme Lord. Everything, everything should be done for Him. So in that regard, Prabhupada quotes the Bhagavad Gita, ninth chapter, right? Karma Yoga. Do everything for the service of Krishna. And always remember Krishna. Never forget Him. There is the, the basic principle. Maharaj Prabhupada gives different examples of different devotees, how they became devotees. Prahlad Maharaj worshipped the Lord even in his very childhood, at the age of five. And Dhruva also, even in, he worshipped the Lord as a child. And Dhruva, oh, no, uh, Maharaj Ambarish worshipped the Lord when he was a youth. And Ajamila, oh no, Dhritarashtra, at the last stage of life, at the, at the, at the last stage of his frustration and in his old age, Dhritarashtra worshipped the Lord and Ajamila worshipped the Lord at the point of death and Chitraketu worshipped the Lord in heaven and in hell. So at any time, any condition, you see, very interesting, very nice examples given. And then Prabhupada said, even the hellish inhabitants can begin to chant the holy name of the Lord and then they can become elevated from hell to heaven. Simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord, the hellish inhabitants get freed from hell. So Prabhupada has given us a, a lot of evidence here to support the devotional process. And how it's completely open, there's no barriers, it's in any time, any place. Then Prabhupada gives uh, six pointers about, he, at, at the end of the purport, he gives six, six uh, conclusions based on the scriptures by which to understand the importance of devotional service. And then he gives his final conclusion. Right? The final conclusion is that the whole matter is explained by the Lord Himself. And one who has no approach to the Lord in his personal feature can rarely understand the purport of Srimad Bhagavatam without being taught by the Bhagavatas in the disciplic succession. So again, the importance of the, the guidance of the pure devotees is essential. We have to understand these things with the help of the devotees. Now these four verses, they're often taken, as I said, the impersonalists are very quick to grab these four verses and they emphasize them. They don't give much importance to Lord Krishna. They don't care so much about uh, the prayers of the different devotees, how they're praying to the Supreme Lord. But they take advantage of this Chatur Shloki to emphasize their impersonal teachings. But Prabhupada said, in the purport here, at the end of the purport, he said, it should be carefully noted that the four slokas were first described by the personality of Godhead himself. Where did these four slokas come from? Somebody has to teach them. They don't just come from nowhere. They have to have some origin. So they come from the Lord himself. So that, in that way, we can refute the challenges of the impersonalists. Okay, are there any more questions or comments on this chapter Shloki before we go on to the rest of the chapter? Mm. 
Lalita, any more questions? I have a small question. Yes, Mariji. Uh, yes, uh, Pr uh, Maharaj, you, you have told uh, when question asked in Dulika, Gita and Dulika Mataji, ki, uh, you told that uh, Mahavishnu is the original Vishnu and uh, Garbhodakshai Vishnu is the expansion of Mahavishnu and Shirodakshai Vishnu is also expansion of uh, Garbhodakshai Vishnu. Uh, but when any problems comes to Brahmaji, he goes to Shirodakshai Vishnu. So when uh, the original Vishnu is Mahavishnu, so why he goes to Shirodakshai Vishnu? Well, you have to understand they're all Vishnu. They're the same Vishnu. Who just, it's just that he's expanded himself into different situations. Just like Lord Krishna, he's one, but he expands himself. So the same way, Karano Dakishai Vishnu, Garbha Dakishai Vishnu, Shiru Dakishai Vishnu, they're just names according to his function in different places, situations, but it's the same Vishnu, the same Lord Vishnu, the personality of Godhead. So there's no difference whether you are, whether you go to Mahavishnu or Shiru Dakishai Vishnu or Garbha Dakishai Vishnu, they're all Lord Vishnu, the same personality. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's confusing because they have these names, but the name is just given because of their function. They're doing their duty in particular places, so that distinguishes them. But, Maharaj? Yes. Here can we can all I want to ask that when we can also understand that Shirodakshai Vishnu is easily approachable than Mahavishnu. Because uh, he is uh, in the souls also, and uh, Mahavishnu is like he is everything, all the universes. So, Brahmaji, go there. Well, <laughs> it's the same. You know, you may say it's easier to approach, you, you may feel a closer connection to him, that he's in the universe. Yeah, you could think like that, but it's the same person. It's just, just like somebody, you know. You, you know, somebody's in the office and somebody's at home. So sometimes he's, he's in the office, so it, it maybe it's difficult to approach the person in the office. You meet him at home, it's the same person, but when he's at home, it's easier to talk to him. When you go to his office, he's so busy, you don't get a chance to talk to him so well. But it's the same person. Right? Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. I have a question. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for teaching at Bhagavatam. So, I have a question regarding this uh, Chattu Sloki. So, why does the Lord give in the order of like when we go normally, Sambandha, Abhita, and then Prayojana? But why did the Lord speak about the Sambandha, then Prayojana, then Pitaya Maharaj? <laughs> yes, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it just happened like that. I don't quite know that, that you know, I'm not able to fully understand the, the reasoning of the Lord, but that's how it's explained like this. We could say, you know, from the Sambandha, we should know what is the goal. It's not that we have to, we have to, that, that they have to be presented like that, but he tells us the goal and then he tells us how to achieve the goal. Of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, it was different, but it didn't have to be like that in the Bhagavad Gita. It just, Krishna spoke it like that. He, Krishna spoke the Sambandha and then he told the process and then said, this is the goal. But in the Bhagavatam, he's telling us the knowledge and then he's telling us the goal and then he's telling us how to achieve this goal. So it's not restricted that it has to be this one way, that it has to be first Ambanda and then Abhidaya. You know that there's some freedom there. Yeah, understood, Mara. Thank you so much. Yeah, the Lord is not obliged that He has to do it this, you know, just only that one particular way. He has His freedom. Okay? All right, thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll just go ahead to see the rest of the chapter to finish it off. Uh, 
So text number 37, 37, the Lord is still speaking to Brahma. He said, just follow the conclusions by concentration of mind. No pride will disturb you, neither in the partial nor in the final devastation. All right? Brahma was worried that I may become proud. I will think I'm the creator. I think I'm the doer. It's a problem. We have to be very cautious. We get people, you know, it's so amazing, you know, people do Bhakti Shastri course and they get so proud sometimes because they've done the Bhakti Shastri course. At one point we had a, a special course that uh, what should be the proper behaviour of a Bhakti Shastri graduate because there were complaints coming from temples. They said, we sent some people to do Bhakti Shastri and after they came from Bhakti Shastri course, they don't want to come to class anymore. They say, we know everything already. We've already studied everything. We don't need to come for your classes anymore. <laughs> so they become so proud, you know, because I'm a Bhakti Shastri graduate. I know everything. <laughs> Very interesting. So, Brahma, what to think? A Lord Brahma, he's doing creation. You do something like creation, you can really get proud. Of course, you're humble because you get the gopis. The gopis say, you're stupid. You're hopeless creator because you make it, made our eyes which blink. <laughs> so, he, he lost his pride when the gopis started talking, cursing him. Okay, so very important that uh, we should keep a humble mood in our service to Krishna. Prabhupada writes in the purport, uh, halfway through the purport, he says, uh, By following the instructions of the bona fide spiritual master, in conjunction with the principles of revealed scriptures, the student will rise to the plane of complete knowledge which will be exhibited by development of detachment from the world of sense gratification. So this is the sign that somebody has properly practiced devotional service, that we must develop that detachment from sense gratification. We can understand how much we're progressing, by how much we're getting free of the desire for sense gratification. So, people often ask like that, you can point out to them. And then, Prabhupada can, uh, a little further on in the purport, he says, in this stage of full satisfaction and detachment from the sensory world, one can know the mystery of the science of God with all its confidential intel intricacies and not by grammar or academic speculation. Because Brahma qualified himself for such reception, the Lord was pleased to disclose the purpose, the purpose of Srimad Bhagavatam. So Brahma qualified himself by his sincere devotion, by his mood of devotion and surrender. And of course, but he did so much penance, which was very pleasing to the Lord. And therefore Prabhupada writes about satisfaction, full satisfaction and detachment from the sensory world. Then that will help us to know the mysteries of Krishna consciousness. So we want to cultivate these kind of qualities. Detachment, giving up sense gratification and it, it being satisfied in Krishna consciousness. Not being greedy for mundane achievements, but being happy with our devotional service.
And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about how we can actually know the Vaikuntha planets. We can actually see the Lord. We can see his abode, seen just as it, as it was seen and experienced by Brahma. And Prabhupada says, such Vaikuntha realization is possible by any devotee of the Lord situated in the transcendental position as a result of devotional service. So, you're interested to see God? You want to see the kingdom of God? <laughs> Just continue with devotional service. One devotee was describing, he said, before he became a devotee, he had the desire to see God. He always thought, I want to see God, I want to see God. And then he heard about the Hare Krishnas and there was a Swami there. He can show you God. And he thought, oh, I want to go there, I'm going to go there and meet him. And he wanted to see God. He went there to the temple. So he went to the temple. I said, I want to see God. He said, the very first thing Prabhupada spoke about was, don't try to see God. <laughs> he was completely shocked. Everybody was telling him, the Swami can show you God. The first thing Prabhupada said was, don't try to see God, but act in such a way that God will want to see you. <laughs> so, that was Prabhupada's teaching. And Prabhupada concludes that purport, 37, Srimad Bhagavatam is the science of the Lord in which the Lord and his abode are perfectly realized. Prabhupada said, just study the Srimad Bhagavatam and one day you will see Krishna in the pages of the Bhagavatam. So we keep studying Srimad Bhagavatam and one day we hope we will also see Krishna here in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. So Sukadeva Goswami is now speaking to Maharaj Parikshit. We were hearing about the Lord instructing Brahma. Now Sukadeva Goswami is instructing Maharaj Parikshit. He was narrating all of this to Maharaj Parikshit. And he tells Maharaj Parikshit that the personality of Godhead, after being seen in his transcendental form, instructing Brahmaji, the leader of the living entities, disappeared. So the Lord had appeared to Brahmaji and then after instructing him, then he disappeared. So then what happens? On the disappearance of the personality of Godhead, then Brahma begins the work of recreation. With folded hands, he began to recreate the universe full with living entities as it was previously. So Brahma takes up his work. He knew what he had to do. He'd been given his duty, his service. An interesting point from the purport, Prabhupada writes, originally the senses of the living entity were awarded for this purpose, namely to engage them in the transcendental loving service of the Lord or that of his devotees. But the conditioned souls illusioned by the material energy become captivated by sense enjoyment. So this is the problem. We have been given these bodies by the grace of Krishna. This body with senses and these senses belong to the Supreme Lord and they're meant to be used in the service of the Lord. But due to our ignorance, we become absorbed in doing so many other things. We forget what is our real business. So we have to learn how to use everything in the proper way. The impersonalists, they want to stop using the senses. That is like the person who has a cataract in his eye, 
you want to have the eye taken out. If you take the eye out, that was not, that's not proper. We just want to take the catter out, take out the disease. Or someone may have a fever and the doctor comes and gives an injection and he kills the patient, the person dies. Is that, this, is that the cure of the fever? You get the injection and the person dies. Doctor said, fever's gone. <laughs> fever's gone, but the person's dead. What's the good? So the same way the impersonalists, their idea is to kill everything. Not this, not that, nothing, nothing. Niti, niti. Right? They want to negate everything. We want to just simply take out the disease and then use everything properly in the service of Krishna. So that's the point. So then, uh, Lord Brahma situates himself in acts of regulative principles, desiring self-interest for the welfare of all living entities. And then Narada, son of Brahma, always ready to serve his father, follows the instructions of his father by mannerly behavior, meekness and sense control. Narada very much pleased his father and desired to know all about the energies of Vishnu, the master of all energies. The great sage Narada inquired in detail from his father, Brahma, the great grandfather of all the universe, after seeing him well satisfied. Thereupon, the supplementary Vedic literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, which was described by the Personality of Godhead and which contains ten characteristics, was told with satisfaction by the father Brahma to his son Narada. So here we have the origin of the Srimad Bhagavatam. There are ten characteristics in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and we'll be hearing about these tomorrow. In major Puranas there are ten character characteristics. In lesser Puranas there's only five characteristics. But Srimad Bhagavatam has all ten characteristics. So we are hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam through the parampara, the sound representation, as it came from Lord Brahma to Narada. Of course, Lord Brahma, he got the knowledge from his father. So Narada got the knowledge of Srimad Bhagavatam and he passed it on to Vyasadeva. And Vyasadeva meditated on devotional service and compiled the Srimad Bhagavatam as we know it today. So then the final verse of the chapter, your questions as to how the universe became manifested from the gigantic form of the Personality of Godhead, as well as other questions, I shall answer in detail by explanation of the four verses already mentioned. So, we will see tomorrow the ten topics, characteristics of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, we will see the explanation of the four verses, the Chatur Sloki. Prabhupada writes in the purport here of this final verse, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the answers depend only on the qualification of the person who explains them. The ten divisions of Srimad Bhagavatam, as explained by the great speaker Srila Sukadeva Goswami, are the limitations of all questions, and intelligent persons will derive all, will derive all intellectual benefits from them 
by proper utilization. So Srila Prabhupada is emphasizing the qualification of the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam, that we have to hear in the proper manner. Many persons, they may be speaking Srimad Bhagavatam, we know there's Bhagavat Saptas, there are professional reciters, Srimad Bhagavatam. And now even we have the impersonalists, the Mayavadis even, they're also entering into the topics of Srimad Bhagavatam and explaining them in their way. And we have to be very cautious about what we hear and who we hear from. So Prabhupada's purports are very, very important, very powerful for us. If we read Prabhupada's purports again and again, then we're, we're, we can be sure we're on the safe path, that there's no danger there. Everything will be revealed through Srila Prabhupada's purports. All right, are there any questions? Any other points to bring up? Discussion? Okay, if there are no questions, then we'll meet you tomorrow and we'll go on to chapter 10 tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Yeah. Go back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna. Yeah.